Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022-2023 Ewan Lecture. I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the Education and Outreach Officer here at the Arthur B. Macdonald Canadian Astroparticle Physics Research Institute. We're a collection of scientists, universities, and research labs across Canada using both the smallest and largest cosmic phenomena to understand the basic laws that govern the universe. And I'm also here at uh, the Physics Department of Queen's University. So thank you all for joining us tonight, either here in person or we do have a number of people joining us online. And uh, yeah, so thank you wherever you're joining us from. A little bit about myself, I'm a galactic astronomer who studies how galaxies form and change, but I'm also an educator and a science communicator. And so given all this, I think I'm very excited, and I hope you're all very excited, for, uh, to hear from our speaker tonight, who is a fantastic scientist, as well as a great speaker and storyteller, storyteller as well. And of course, learning from each other and from the land has long been facilitated through stories. So tonight, for many of us here at Queen's University, home is the lands of the Cataraqui, now Kingston, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and many indigenous peoples before them. Indigenous people who have long practiced storytelling as a means of teaching and learning. And I'm truly appreciative that all of us are able to be here and learn tonight from our respective lands. Personally, again, I am a settler born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the traditional land of the Eskikawak, that's the skin dresser territory of the Mi'kmaq. And as an astronomer, someone who revels in the wonders of the land, the skies, the planet, the universe, I recognize that this science relies on facilities that use traditional and sacred lands of various indigenous peoples. Peoples who have a voice to add to the science and who should be gatekeepers to these spaces. And so to all of you, I urge you to think of the connection that you have with the land around you and the gift that we have to learn wherever we are. Of course, this week, finally, marks the spring equinox, the beginning of spring. And so as the days become warmer and the nights a little bit more pleasant, I encourage you all to uh, get out there and engage with the land and to be mindful of the opportunities that we have to learn from it, to learn from the experiences that we have with it. And I encourage you to reflect on the connections that you have to the various lands and places throughout your life and of the people, sorry, and reflect on the connections you have to various lands and places and of the people who have been stewards of these places and the role that these places have played in your life. So tonight marks the first Ewan lecture since November 2021. And so to say a few words about George and Maureen Ewan, after which the Ewan lecture is named, I'd like to invite up Dr. Arthur B. McDonald. So thank you. Welcome. Uh, I uh, just want to say a, a few words about uh, George and Maureen Ewan, uh, good friends and uh, uh, actually the people who endowed the lecture this evening. Um, George and I have been colleagues throughout his many years um, and uh, I've often said to people if you, if you want to have a good career in science just follow George Ewan around because I uh, uh, knew him uh, when uh, he was at Chalk River. Uh, he, uh, I was there as a postdoc and he, he left in uh, 1970 to come here to Queens and subsequently the chairman of the physics department here. And so he opened up a position at Chalk River that I uh, obtained the next year. And then later uh, I came back to Canada to Queens uh, to uh, uh, take over uh, the Canadian uh, part of the uh, uh, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, for which George was uh, was the one of the founders of the whole project back in 1984. George is really a pioneering scientist in in many different ways. Uh, he has an award from the Institute of Electrical Engineering uh, for having been the first person to use a so-called germanium detector for the detection of, of gamma rays. 
uh, in uh, uh, nuclear physics, but in, in this case it really revolutionized the ability to do uh, medical physics, to do trace analysis, to increase, in this case, the resolution by uh, many orders of magnitude over what was the, uh, the norm at the time. And uh, he was a pioneer again in the being one of the two founding co-spokespersons, along with Herb Chen, of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory project that really has uh, uh, made Canada uh, an international center in the field of, uh, of particle astrophysics, uh, and particularly because Canada has uh, the lowest radioactivity location in the world at what has now become Snow Lab, uh, building on the original success of the Snow Project in, uh, in Sudbury. But I, I've been uh, uh, speaking about uh, uh, George, and, and uh, as it says uh, in the plaque on a uh, bench, which has recently been established just, just outside Grant Hall, actually, just uh, further up University Avenue here, um, near a uh, uh, um, set of plaques that describe the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory project. But it says a, a, a visionary scientist and a wonderful human being, which I, I and a number of his friends over here can attest to, including his daughter Elizabeth, who uh, uh, we're very pleased to have here this evening, uh, and a pioneer in the field of nuclear and astroparticle physics in, in Canada and one of the founding fathers. But Maureen herself, in terms of her activities here at Queen's, uh, was a uh, uh, as it says, a dedicated advocate for the well-being of others and a fervent supporter of the Van Rees Center here at uh, Queen's, which is a, a center for the support of, of female students, particularly here at Queen's. And uh, she has, she mentored and counseled students over many years. And so it's very appropriate that this lecture is, uh, in fact, uh, named after and dedicated to the memory of uh, uh, of both of them. And so I, I hope you'll enjoy the, the lecture. Uh, uh, Vicki also has been a friend for, for many years. And she is really uh, one of the principal astrophysicists in, in Canada. And uh, she has been a leader on uh, the development of the uh, CHIME uh, radio observatory for fast radio bursts, which is quite a remarkable achievement, as you'll hear. And I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, the lecture. So uh, thank you very much. I'll turn this back over to uh, Mark, who I think is going to introduce Vicki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our Ewan Lent speaker. So Professor Victoria Caspi is originally from Austin, Texas, but moved to Canada quite young. She completed her undergrad at phys in physics at McGill and did her PhD at Princeton under Joseph Taylor, who I was just found out today at lunch, the day before she was going to defend her PhD, is, actually was the day that uh, Dr. Taylor won the Nobel Prize for looking at how pulsar binaries spin was, uh, was uh, being affected by the, maybe the emission of gravitational waves. And so I was told that then Vic Vicky was very eager to move on to maybe other things, thinking I guess that all the, the Nobel Prize had already been awarded to that, I don't know. <laughs> But uh, she did indeed move on to other things and other fields, but didn't stray too far. She had research positions at Caltech, at JPL, and at MIT, studying supernova remnants and weird X-ray pulsars. But since 1999, she has been a faculty member at McGill, where she is the Lauren Trottier Professor of Astrophysics and Cosmology and the director of the Trottier Space Institute. She now focuses on the cosmologically enigmatic fast radio verse, acting as the principal investigator of the CHIME telescope. Fast Radio Burst team, which we're going to hear about tonight. So, Professor Caspi, I am really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can you all? Oh, because well, I'm mic'd up right now. Uh, yeah, so it's a real pleasure and a tremendous honor to be the UN lecturer. I'm really delighted uh, to be here. And I've had a, a really wonderful, stimulating day uh, at the um, 
uh, here at Queens, meeting so many uh, wonderful faculty and amazing uh, graduate students. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm also excited to tell you about the fast radio cosmos. And uh, really what I want to tell you is um, about an astrophysical uh, mystery. And, and really this is um, the story of uh, fast radio bursts, these mysterious uh, events that I'm going to describe to you is uh, an interesting tale of how science uh, is done. It's a very, you'll see a very non-linear, complicated twists and turns, all sorts of uh, uh, different surprises along the way that I'm going to tell you about. Uh, and, and just see it as a, as a, as a case study of how science uh, actually in real life uh, is, is accomplished. So um, these, these, uh, this mystery, these uh, mysterious uh, radio bursts, they have captured the imagination of, of the public and made it into a lot of uh, popular press. Uh, you can see, um, uh, here's an example, you know, New York Times and uh, uh, Scientific American, et cetera. Um, now, you know, when you think about uh, these bursts, uh, it, it, does, it, it doesn't automatically jive with how we think about the cosmos, how you think about, for example, the night sky, which I think to many people seems kind of um, unchanging, very uh, serene and calm. And if you, I'm, I'm sure some of you are probably familiar with this uh, constellation. Does anybody know what it is? Orion, yes, thank you. And uh, uh, it's upside down. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Uh, well, upside depends on your where you're looking at it from. But anyway, um, uh, relative for us, it's upside down. And um, you know, if you go out, you know, tomorrow night or or in a hundred years or in a thousand years, you're always going to see Orion there. It's um, it doesn't vary. It's not time variable. Now, of course, that bright star over there, some of you might know it's called Betelgeuse. And, and that one might, is actually thought to, to be likely to explode sometime very soon, sometime any, any time in the next, uh, you know, 100 to, to 10,000 years, very soon. Uh, but that's on an astronomical time scale. That's a, that's a blink of an eye at 10,000 years. That's, that's really not very long. But in fact, the night sky is very volatile. And uh, our eyes don't necessarily appreciate it, but with good technology and sophisticated equipment, we can, we can start to see that, that, that many objects in the sky are highly variable, including just, this is our own sun seen through UV filter. Uh, this is a NASA SOHO, SOHO mission, and this is a time-lapse uh, image. You can see the rotation of the sun. And, and quite apart from the rotation, you can see that the sun is uh, tremendously active, actually. Sometimes we have solar flares, coronal mass ejections. You can see uh, just even small scale variability in the, in the magnetic field structure that the sun is highly variable. And of course, uh, other things in the cosmos change and move. Um, 400 years ago, Galileo knew that uh, the, the planet Jupiter was orbited by uh, the four Galilean moons. Of course, today, today we know there's many more moons that. It, he couldn't see, but even with a small telescope, he could see the moons, and you could see his hand sketch here, uh, that they were moving with time. They were orbiting the planet. That was clearly the night sky was changing. That was very much against religious dogma at the time. But uh, uh, another example in here very predictably, but there's other things that change in, in very non-predictable and very dramatic ways, like um, this is now an artist's picture of... Uh, uh, in this case, it's a, um, my, it stopped. What happened here? Hang on. You lost the screen sharing. We lost the screen sharing? Uh, anyway, is everything okay with the Zoom? Should I? Uh, I don't have this screen share. Please excuse me for one moment. I will pause this. Um, let's hope this all works really smooth. <laughs> how 
How are we doing? That's Better? great, thank you. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so this is an example of an of a explosion called a nova explosion that we see pretty commonly in the galaxy. We see a, some a white dwarf star that's pulling matter, gravitationally pulling matter off a, compa a binary companion star, and that matter heats up and causes thermonuclear explosions on the surface of the white dwarf. And we see this as massive X-ray bursts in the sky. This is, although this is an artist concept, we actually do see this um, uh, with X-ray uh, satellites. Or we also see sometimes stars colliding with each other. And this is again a, an artist animation of two neutron stars in a, a decaying orbit due to the emission of gravitational waves. Uh, and this is something uh, you can see they get faster as they approach each other. And, and eventually you can guess what's going to happen. It's going to be pretty spectacular any minute now. There they go. Uh, you'll see an explosion. And this, this is observed, observed both with gravitational wave detectors and with optical telescopes that will see the flash and the slow decay of the, of the, um, of the remnant in this what we call a kilonova explosion. I'm really sorry. I don't know why it does that. Let's try again. Okay. But um, so I'm here, but I'm here to tell you about fast radio bursts, something else that's highly variable in the sky. And I want to be sure we're all on the same page. So when I say fast radio bursts, many of you picture, so not the young people, young people don't know what this thing is, but um, people of my age know, oh, that's a radio. Uh, which has um, uh, an antenna that detects radio waves uh, in the, that are propagating in, in, in the sky that are coming from, uh, you know, some radio transmitter. And it has a speaker. So internally, there's some analog electronics that uh, convert the currents in that antenna that are excited by the waves in the air uh, and co produce currents that you can amplify and uh, filter and send to the speaker. And you even had this little dial here where you could select the specific frequency of radio waves that would allow you to listen to your favorite radio station. So you would turn a dial and this little thing would move around and that would change some of the electronics inside and uh, allow you to hear just the signal on that single radio frequency. In this case, it's a uh, uh, you see it's uh, in, in made in megahertz and cycles per second, about 100 megahertz in the uh, FM, uh, FM band. Now, so radio waves, though, we're used to radio waves being, um, you know, your cell phone is using them, but they're used by radios, television, or used, they used to be. Um, but radio waves are not something special, unique. They're really part, they're really a type of light. The same light that is uh, arriving at your eyes from me, that you're, you're looking at me with, radio waves are the same thing, just at a different frequency. And uh, all of light is part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum, where um, our eyes are sensitive to only a very narrow portion of that spectrum, uh, the, the colors of the rainbow. And, uh, that, and these different colors just different, differ by the different uh, frequencies. So that uh, red is a lower frequency than violet. Violet's a higher frequency. And in fact, you know your eyes, they, they peter out in the red because uh, they can't see what's just beyond the red, which is called infrared light. Although you can buy infrared goggles and that helps you see it. And, and similarly, uh, beyond the violet, there's the ultraviolet, which your eyes can't quite see, but it's there. And, and if you continue in, in other directions, or you continue to short to higher and higher frequencies, you go from ultraviolet to X-rays to gamma rays, or you can go in the other direction. You can go from red to infrared to microwaves, all the way to radio waves. And so when I say fast radio bursts, what I mean is that these are explosions that are producing lots and lots of radio light. And you can say, well, why? And I, I can say, okay, I don't know. We're going to see. Now, um, so what are fast radio bursts? I, these are bursts of radio waves that last just a few milliseconds. So just a few thousandths 
of a second, very brief. They are all over the sky. Uh, the first one was detected, this, so this is a radio telescope. This is a telescope that is sensitive to radio waves. What happens is it's a giant dish, and, and this is large. So this is a 64 meter dish. You can see this is a three-story building for scale. I actually did a lot of my PhD thesis uh, sitting in that building. And the radio waves come from uh, the cosmos. They bounce off the dish, which is a nice parabolic surface, which focuses all of the radio waves to this uh, structure here, which, which, which contains an antenna. Antenna just like on the radio that I showed you. And it excites currents in there that are then amplified and filtered in the same way and sent down to computers that are in the, in the, in the control room, which is in, in here. And, and by the way, one of these legs, it has a ladder which I, I, ha I have climbed many times. I, in fact, I once climbed it pregnant. Uh, it was crazy, I don't know what I was thinking. Anyway, um, this is the telescope that discovered the first uh, fast radio burst, and I'll, I'll tell you about that shortly. But first, I just wanna tell you that these fast radio bursts, they're not some weird anomaly. They're not something that uh, just happens very rarely. These are ubiquitous in, in the universe. This is something very, very common in the universe they, uh, the estimated sky rate, that is, if you could look, if you had a telescope that could see the entire sky all the time, you would detect every single day about a thousand of these events, roughly a thousand of these events. Uh, so something is very commonly producing these in the, in the universe, but we don't know what it is. They or, their origin's unknown. And one thing I can say, for certainty is that they're not microwave ovens, and you might wonder why. I'll explain why I say that uh, a little later. And so if you want to know how we, so people sometimes ask, well, how do you see the fast radio burst? And so this is sort of an artist concept, and, and, and this is not how we see. We can't see the radio waves. We detect the currents induced by the, uh, and we, uh, it, induced in the antenna that's then digitized and reported on a computer. So how do we see a fast radio burst? This is the first fast radio burst ever detected. We call it the Lorimer burst because uh, the lead author on the publication in Science Magazine where it was reported, his name was Duncan Lorimer, because it's actually a friend of mine. And what this is a, what's plotted here is what we actually see from the radio telescope. This is uh, time on the x-axis, and this is a whole 500 milliseconds. So all of this entire, this entire data set is just half a second long. And this is now all the radio frequencies that the antenna, that the telescope can be sensitive to. So whereas your radio, you tune and you pick out one radio frequency, uh, this telescope can detect many radio frequencies at once and they're all digitized and they're all recorded as a function of time. And you can safely ignore this horizontal line that's at a single radio frequency because it's a TV station and we don't care about that. So the actual astrophysical signal is this thing that's sweeping through the band. We call it the, the, the band width, that's the, all the frequencies. It's sweeping through all the different radio frequencies with the highest radio frequencies arriving earliest. And that is right there, very, very important observation. And I'll, I'll come back to it. And the reason it's, it's important is because that is what's telling us that these objects are coming from cosmological distances. That is, they're coming from far, far outside the Milky Way galaxy. And you might say, well, how does that tell you that? And I'll explain. But first I wanna say that this sweep, we correct for in software. We, we'll call, we call it dispersion and we, we, we just delay it because at the source, all the radio frequencies are emitted at the same time. And so once you correct for that, and then you sum up all the radio frequencies together, you get what's inside this box. Basically you have nothing, noise, garbage, a big burst, and then nothing. And it disappears and the source never came back. So it just lasted a few milliseconds and then it was gone. Now, um, why do I say, it? so I say it, it comes from way outside our Milky Way galaxy and let's just be sure everybody's on the same page. Um, our Milky Way galaxy is a spiral galaxy, and, and you can be certain that this is not the Milky Way galaxy because it's hard to take a picture of your house uh, when you're standing inside of it. 
So this is a spiral galaxy that would be a lot like the Milky Way. And just so everybody knows, uh, we're on the edge of the spiral. Um, and so, so if this were the Milky Way, we'd be approximately there. And when I say from cosmological distances, it's important to understand the scale of the universe. So, uh, you know, here's Earth. If you zoom far out of Earth, I'm sorry, it's a little dim. But um, this is the solar system here. And, and if you see a red smudge, that's the Earth. And the sun's in the middle. And then if you zoom way out of the solar system, you see the interstellar neighborhood, which is all the nearest, nearest stars to us. And then the entire solar system is just a little red smudge in the middle uh, on that scale. And then if you zoom far, far out of the interstellar neighborhood, and you see the Milky Way galaxy, here you can see now the entire interstellar neighborhood is just a tiny little smudge on the scale of the whole galaxy. And then if you zoom far out of that, if you zoom far out of the galaxy, you find our galaxy is actually a part of uh, a local galactic group of galaxies. Here's the Milky Way now, a little, little smudge. This is the Andromeda galaxy. And then if you zoom out of that, you find that our entire group of local group of galaxies is actually part of the what we call the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. And now the entire local galactic group is just a little red smudge over here on this scale. And then if you keep zooming out, you keep zooming out, this, uh, the, just the Virgo supercluster is part of a group of superclusters. And now it's just a little tiny smudge. And then if you zoom further out, you get to the scale, uh, to the cosmological scale, where the universe starts to look pretty, uh, pretty uniform everywhere. And each one of these smudges is a super cluster of galaxies. And so what I'm telling you is that fast radio bursts are coming to us from this distance scale, from distance scales of the, the, the largest cosmological scale. So billions of light years away. Now, how do I know this? It's, 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 it's quite a claim. How, how can we know this? So I mentioned that the radio waves were dispersed. And let me explain to you about dispersion. You actually know about dispersion. Everybody here knows about dispersions because you've seen rainbows. A rainbow uh, is water droplets in our atmosphere that are dispersing sunlight into its constituent colors. Uh, if I had a prism, geez, if I had known that was going to... Anyway, um, so if you take white light and you send it through a prism, it breaks into all the different colors of the rainbow. And we call that, it's, it's dispersing the light. It's splitting it into its different frequencies, its different colors. So um, now they spread out. That means that they change their direction slightly in a frequency dependent way. But what's not so obvious is that it also changes the speed at which the light travels. So that different frequencies actually travel at different speeds. So if you sent a pulse of white light, the different colors would come out at different times, even though you sent them all at the same time. So that's dispersion. And you might, have, you might say, wait a minute, you're saying the different colors of light travel at different speeds? I thought all light travels at the same speed. C, Einstein's constant. Um, yeah, that's actually true, but only in a vacuum. When light travels in material, in matter, it interacts a little bit with that matter, and it slows it down in a way that depends on radio fre uh, on, on frequency, on color. So yes, uh, speed of light is a constant, but only in a vacuum. Now, space is not a vacuum. So when you look out into the cosmos, here is a lovely picture of the uh, plane of the Milky Way galaxy. You see there's tons of stuff there. There's dust and there's gas and there's ionized gas. There's ions and free electrons everywhere. And free electrons in particular are, uh, are uh, very relevant to this story because free electrons disperse radio waves just like glass disperses optical light. So what do I mean? 
So um, let's say here's, here's, a here's a Earth and here's a little telescope that I'm gonna tell you about soon. And let's, let's say I'm gonna emit a, 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 a radio burst here. I'm gonna, it's, I'm gonna do it so that you could see it with optical light and you're gonna see how it travels in a, in a frequency dependent kind of way. So there's, it starts out all the colors together white and as it propagates, the blue travels faster and arrives on Earth sooner. And so the, 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 the and that's exactly what the fast radio burst does. So you can see it again. See, it spreads out as it propagates because of its interaction with free electrons uh, in the galaxy. And now, why am I telling you so much about this? It's, it's important because we know where, we have, we have maps of where all the free electrons are in our galaxy. And so this is not our galaxy, but um, this is our galaxy. This is a model of our galaxy. It's a model of the free electron distribution in our galaxy, as if you were looking down on it um, from the, uh, from, from above, you can see the spiral arms and where it's darker, those, there's more free electrons and that's quantified, we know this. So this is a, a galaxy dispersion and this is a, a contour plot that's showing you the same thing. Here's, here's actually the center of our galaxy and, and the Pac-Man is where we're located off on the edge. It's now rotated compared to how I showed it to you before. You have spiral arms. And this is a contour plot, not of altitude as you would see if you were going hiking, uh, but a contour plot of constant total free electron column depth, the total number of free electrons. So in any direction, the point is in any direction, we know how many electrons the galaxy is providing. So if you see a source over there and you measure its dispersion, you know how far away it is. And this is very well calibrated. So we know a lot about this. And, in, and it's a three-dimensional model. Here I've just shown you a slice through the disk of the galaxy, but it really it's a three-dimensional model so we can look in any direction and we know how many free electrons are, con being, are provided by the galaxy. And so we know the maximum. Eventually the galaxy runs out, the galaxy ends. And so, now you can understand how we know fast radio bursts are coming from cosmological distances because this amount of dispersion, uh, the dispersion of this burst, we, we, we abbreviate it with dispersion measure dm, is 375 in our crazy units. Don't worry about the units. But the maximum the galaxy in this direction can provide is 25. So this isn't just a little bit more than what the galaxy can provide. This is, this, this is way, way more than anything the galaxy can provide. And um, so, so that, this is how we know it's way outside our galaxy. And as I'll explain, even if you don't buy this argument, we've now c confirmed it directly and, and I'll explain how. But, but once you realize it's way, it, it, that it's outside our galaxy, it has to be way outside the galaxy because the, the, all the free electrons are clumped in galaxies. Once you leave, the intergalactic medium is very tenuous. There's not a lot of gaps there. And so to collect all this, to have this huge dispersion, it must have gone through tons of plasma. It must have come from a very, very far distance away. And so if it's very far away, and yet we can detect it on Earth, it has to be really, really bright. It has to pack quite a punch. It has to be a very powerful, albeit brief, explosion of some kind. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, Parkes, the Parkes Telescope in Australia found the first fast radio burst, and then they started finding more. And then they started finding some that looked a little weird, that didn't look like all the others. And here's an example. They called them for a while. They didn't know what they were, and they gave them this funky name, peritons. Um, so what was unusual about them is that the peritons had these very strange frequency sweeps that were kind of clumpy, and they always had the, the pulse looked a little bit strange. Um, but the frequency sweep was not exactly what you it had this weird structure in it. And so then they, 
um, made an interesting plot. They collected a, a few dozen of these events. They started observing them, and they, they plotted them where the, the light gray ones are the paratons, the ones with the weird frequency sweeps. And the dark ones are the ones that didn't have strange sweeps that, that looked a little more uniform. And what they noticed is that the paratons always peaked at lunchtime. Um, and so the cosmos should not know. The universe does not know when it's lunchtime in Australia. And so this was suspicious. And indeed, um, they eventually realized that the paratons were actually being caused by a microwave oven on the site. Um, and it wasn't just the microwave oven. It was, so it was lunchtime, people were warming up their lunch. It's the impatient people who would open the microwave door before it had stopped. And for some reason that, we, that still isn't understood, it does produce a brief burst of radio waves that was then detected. And so it wasn't only when they opened the microwave oven door before it had stopped, the telescope also had to be pointed in the direction of the, of the visitor center where there was a microwave oven. So it was, you needed all that to happen and then they, you would detect paratons. And this was figured out by a graduate student who stood at the microwave oven door because they, they were suspicious and would turn it on, open it, know it's a time, close it, open it, close it. And somebody in the telescope, yeah, we saw one, yeah, we saw one, and, and they figured it out. So that, you know, this is, it, it sounds really funny, and, but it's, it's true. And I, I think um, it's an example, I told you, twists and turns in the scientific method, uh, scientific story. They're trying to figure out what these things are. And this result, that it wasn't a microwave oven, um, was published in one of the most prestigious astronomical journals, the, royal, uh, the, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, the source of paratons at the Parkes Telescope. They put it, it's right in their abstract. Uh, subsequent has revealed that a paraton can be generated 1.4 gigahertz when a microwave oven door is open prematurely and the telescope is at the appropriate angle. And I am so proud of scientists. We're scientists. We tell it like it is. When we understand it, we publish it, and we announce it to the world, and we now get it. But, but at least the, the beautiful thing about it is that, OK, those paratons, the lunchtime events, uh, we know they're not astrophysical. But that left all the other ones that were uniform in time and which other telescopes started to see. And uh, this and other distinct observational differences show that fast radio bursts are excellent candidates for genuine extragalactic transients, which today we know they are. So I'm, I, th at the time, this was, this was pretty surprising. So you might say, OK, so what are fast radio bursts? And for a long time, there were more published theories about what they might be than there were detected events, which is a very strange situation to be in. Um, all sorts of different ideas. Could they be exploding stars or colliding stars or an asteroid hitting and impacting on a neutron star or uh, all sorts of things? Um, one model that I highlighted there is that they're magnetars. And uh, let me explain briefly what a magnetar is. Uh, there are these things called neutron stars in our galaxy that are known to explode every now and again. They are extremely, they have the highest magnetic fields known in the universe. And they produce these explosions occasionally when some, some sort of magnetic reconnection or some crust cracking happens on the surface due to some instability in the star. And we typically see this, and this is observed. We see, this is an artist's rendition, but we see it with X-ray satellites, we see bursts bursts of x-rays and, and gamma rays. But they're not known for large radio bursts. But, but hold that thought. Hold that thought. Now, you might say, OK, uh, you know, you think they're cosmological distances. Why don't you just look and see what galaxy they're coming from? Why don't you just, when you detect one, just, just look with an optical telescope and, and see where the ga what galaxy it's coming from. But the, the problem is that a radio telescope has very blurry vision of the sky. 
And if you say, where did it come from? You, you, you can only say, oh, roughly over there. So that the, with the Parkes telescope, the error region, the uncertainty region of where that event originated includes a thousand different galaxies, all at different distances. You, so you can't know, there's no way to know with the Parkes telescope which galaxy it came from. We don't have that information. Now you can go to a bigger telescope, and I'm going to show you soon the uh, a telescope that's no longer functioning. The Arecibo telescope is, is a much larger telescope than Parkes. That helps. That helps. It gives it better vision of the sky, but still it's, it's insufficient. Um, you really need what we call an interferometer. It's a radio telescope consisting of many smaller radio telescopes at great distances. I'm going to show you a picture of that soon. That allows you to pinpoint very precisely on the sky the location of a radio source. But it doesn't let you see very much of the sky at all at any one time. So chances are you're not going to see. You need to get lucky. You don't know when the burst is going to happen or where. If you're looking only there and the burst is over there, you don't see it. So that's, that's, that's the problem with an interferometer. In any case, this is the former Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. This, for a long time, for many years, was the largest telescope on Earth. The aperture here is 300 meters, three football fields across. This is a three-story visitor center. This is a catwalk. This is a catwalk where you can walk up to the speed structure where like 100 people could stand on that thing. It's enormous. There's many hundreds of feet above the surface. Oops. That's me and a couple of my astrophysics colleagues standing at the top of the catwalk here. They, they helpfully make us wear hard hats as if, you know, <laughs> that's really <laughs> gonna help. Um, and if you zoom in, you see my knuckles are white because it's really scary up there. Um, whoops. But Arecibo started, we detected fast radio bursts. We started detecting fast radio bursts with Arecibo. This is the first one we detected. This was the first non-Parks radio, the first non-Parks FRB, and they were, Parks people were so excited because they were so relieved that it wasn't just a bug, some other thing going on. We started seeing, you could see the telltale sweep in this Arecibo data, and then the D-dispersed pulse in the inset. Um, now, an amazing thing happened. So I mentioned to you before, the Lorimer burst, it went off, and then it never came back. And they stared at the sky with the Parkes telescope for days and days and days and days and never saw anything again. With Arecibo, we detected one event and then we went back and we stared at the sky for, for many, many, many hours uh, over many days and nothing happened. And then one day it started bursting again. The same source started repeating. And in one hour, we saw 10 bursts from the same source. And we were just shocked because we didn't think it would repeat. Honestly, I did not think it would repeat. I gave my graduate student the data to analyze, thinking, oh, poor guy, he's going to analyze it all. He's not going to find anything. Oh, well, but we should really do it. And, uh, and then he comes and he says, oh, by the way, I discovered 10 more bursts. And we were like, what? Like, oh, my goodness, we were not expecting that at all. And you can see here. Uh, they've all been de-dispersed, so the dispersion sweep is identical in all of them, but we've removed it. And what was shocking was um, just the wide variety that the source sometimes produced really, really faint bursts, and sometimes honking bright bursts, and sometimes bursts that were really bright at low radio frequencies here, and sometimes bursts that are really bright at high radio frequencies. In fact, these two are just like four seconds apart. And that was just astonishing to us. It's totally unexpected that it repeats. And uh, there's the, gra the graduate student who enjoyed, uh, got to be mentioned in CBC News, Paul Schultz. Um, you know, uh, we got lots of uh, surprising new twists. And indeed, it was very much a surprise that it started to repeat. And immediately, it, it just ruled out entire classes of models, of ideas for what these things could be. Because if you're gonna collide neutron stars, you're not gonna collide them 10 times in one, uh, in one, one hour, uh, you know, months after the first collision, like, that's impossible. So it just ruled it out, at least for this source, all sorts of models. So, so, so it's interesting because it, it at least allowed us to eliminate some ideas, 
But we also knew, ah, oh, that thing repeats. We have a chance. We can go to an interferometer, which has this amazing ability to pinpoint things on the sky, and we know where to point it, at least, and hope that it goes off. And so this is the very large array, called the Jansky Very Large Array uh, in New Mexico, which consists of uh, many... Uh, I, I forget how, I could, I, I could stand here and count it, but it's 20 odd uh, big t radio telescopes, not quite the size of parks, but almost. Uh, and uh, in this case, they're, they're not separated by very much, but they're on tracks. You could separate them by very large distances and get phenomenal, what we call angular resolution, superb pinpoint ability. And so we went to the VLA and we said to them, well, you have to point at this source and, and wait. And you know, People, this is a very powerful instrument. Many, many people want to use it. The director does not keen to let you use it to observe nothing. They don't, they don't like to do that. So, but they gave us time, and we took data, and we saw nothing. Uh, and then we went and we begged for more time, and um, they gave us a ton more time, and we observed and observed, and we saw nothing. And at this point, they were like, okay, get out. And we said, no, no, really, really. And eventually... Uh, on the third observation, so 60 t hours on the VLA, we saw nothing, and still they gave us more data, and then boom. On the third try, uh, we got a nice, beautiful, fast radio uh, burst, the same source. The, the black circles indicate the region that Arecibo told us to look. Uh, and uh, for complicated reasons, it, it, it appears in these data as, this, um, as these lines, but the, 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 where they intersect is the exact position of the fast radio burst. And so with that one burst, and, and by the way, we detected in that session six more uh, with the VLA. So it was silent for 60 hours and suddenly six, it, it, it immediately tells you something. These bursts are clustered. They, they're not random. Um, and there you can see that with the VLA, we could detect the dispersion sweep uh, that was exactly at the same dispersion measure as measured with Arecibo. So you, you know it's the same source. And so that, once we could pinpoint it, it let us then beg for time. Quick, we have to go to this optical telescope and see what galaxy is there. And uh, so we did. So we got time on the 8-meter Gemini telescope in Hawaii. And, um, uh, you know, it's not easy to get time on that, but they, they let us look. And um, we were expecting a, a nice big galaxy, nice big spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. And, and no, no, um, the, the galaxy uh, was, th this is the galaxy. It's like this puny little tiny, tiny, we, they call it a dwarf galaxy. And we were just shocked again. Like, why would it be in this puny little dwarf galaxy? We, we just didn't know. But you can measure the distance to galaxies very easily. And it was at a cosmological distance. It was, roughly, it was roughly at the distance the dispersion measure would predict. So all that story I told you about dispersion of radio waves and you know, models of the galaxy, it's all right. We measured exactly the distance to this galaxy, and indeed it agrees with the dispersion measure prediction. And then we got lots of press. So here in the New York Times wrote us up, radio burst traced to a faraway galaxy, but the caller is probably ordinary physics. So I didn't like that too much. And I thought, you know, I should go to this, this journalist's home in the middle of the night and explode a fast radio burst and see how ordinary he thinks that is. Um, but meanwhile, the New York Post. <laughs> um, so, uh, and I'm going to just say it right now. Um, this is a natural phenomenon. There is absolutely no evidence that this is coming from any sort of intelligent civilization. They're all over the sky. That part of the sky can't. Uh, there's just no way that some civilizations would invent identical technology uh, throughout the history of the universe everywhere. It's a natural thing. So I don't know why they, they went to aliens. I can't answer that question. So pre-2019, where did we stand? I'm telling you everything we knew then. We knew that at least one of them repeats. The others still haven't been seen to repeat. Uh, which ruled out immediately all models, for at least for that source, of, of colliding stars or, or an exploding star, supernova. It can't supernova 10 times in an hour. It's impossible. 
And it enabled the first localization on the sky and the first host galaxy determination and the first confirmation of a cosmological existence. But there were a million open questions. Do all FRBs repeat and you just have to wait? What is the source? And is a repeater different from a non-repeater? And why was it in a tiny galaxy? And so, you know, to answer these questions, you need to find more. And so that brings me to the Chime Telescope which is a new Canadian telescope. It's the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment in Penticton, British Columbia. And you can see it here. You might say, that doesn't look like a radio telescope. And I agree with you, um, but it is. It is not a parabolic dish. It is geom geometry of cylinders. So it's four cylinders. And on the axis of each cylinder, that's where all the, the, the antennas are hanging. So on the axis of each cylinder, there's, you can't see it in this picture, they're, they're, they're much too small, but there's um, 256 antennas along each axis for a total of 1,024 antennas. And this is a large structure. So this is 100 meters by 20 meters. So the whole thing, you have 80 meters by 100 meters. The total collecting area, uh, as I like to say, in Canadian units is uh, approximately five hockey arenas. Um, there's no moving parts. The telescopes just stare overhead. They're oriented north-south, and the sky rotates overhead. So we see the entire sky every single day. Um, it operates in this frequency range. And I said all this. And it's a lot of data. So the antennas are all being uh, sampled. Uh, the, the currents that are induced are being digitized at a rate of 13 terabits. I wrote bytes, but bits per second. Terabits per second. That's comparable to the world's cellular, the entire world's cellular network, all being read out uh, on the site here in supercomputers that are located adjacent to the, to the telescope. And for scale, that's the Chime Fast Radio Burst team standing uh, along the axis. And, and if you squint, you can start to see the antennas there, but you can't, it's not so easy to see. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna skip that. I'll just say that uh, it, 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 it's um, uh, the, the supercomputing, uh, 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 there's about 256 computers in these two shipping containers. These are shipping containers. Uh, and there's another 128 uh, computers in this. And so this is handling the digitization of all the different signals and the, putting them all together into effectively an, uh, like an interferometer. Uh, and then this is, uh, there's the computers in here are searching in real time for fast radio bursts. And um, this is also mostly, almost entirely student and postdoc built. Um, this was a, a huge, uh, no, obviously an engineering company built a structure, but in terms of the cabling, the hanging of the antennas, the building of the antennas, um, you can see uh, all, th this is here, some of the electronics being built by Mei-Ling Deng at UB University of British Columbia. Uh, and then uh, we cabled, we finished, my student Ziggy and I just finished cabling all that, it took us uh, three weeks. Um, so why, why cylinders? Oops. So uh, the normal, um, like a parks-like dish, what can it see on the sky? It sees a tiny little region, tiny little region on the sky. And so when you have a transient, transient events going off all over the sky, uh, it misses most of them. It just doesn't see them. They could, there could be lots of them there, but it has such a small field of view that it just doesn't see them all. It doesn't, or, or catches some, but just rarely. Whereas when you have a cylinder, you're not focusing the light in, in all di both dimensions, only in one dimension. It's like a mirror in the other dimension. So you see a large, much larger area on the sky. And so uh, when you compare the two types of telescopes, the cylindrical telescope will see way more of the sky at any one time. And so for a transient phenomenon, it's, it's fantastic. You just, you just, it, 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 you just capture way more of these events than uh, a, a regular telescope would. And that's why CHIME has been so successful. And here we uh, 
very proud. Our first publication uh, got us on the cover of Nature. Um, the Canadian telescope captures a slew of fast radio bursts. And indeed, this is showing you the number of fast radio bursts that had been detected by all telescopes on the planet prior to CHIME, the Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment turning on. And then once CHIME turned on, uh, we just started cleaning up. Uh, this is an instrument that's fantastic at finding these things. And um, instantly, you know, when you see the entire sky every single day, you start to discover lots and lots of FRBs. And the first thing we found were many, many repeaters. So the Arecibo source was the only repeater before we turned on. We've now, I could update, but we've now found 50 different repeaters. We've un opened the sky. They're all, over the, they're all over the place. You just need the sort of telescope that is capable of detecting them. Um, yeah, so here they're color coded, uh, the different color, all the green ones are the same source, all the pink ones are the same source. It, it's sort of hard to always convey this information. Another thing we discovered was a very luminous burst, a very luminous fast, effectively a fast radio burst, but from a magnetar inside the Milky Way galaxy one that we knew of and had been studying in x-rays for years. And one day it had a huge burst of radio. In fact, it had two bursts of radio waves that Chime captured. And that was a big surprise. It was just before the lockdown of COVID uh, and gave us something to, <laughs> to keep us occupied for a bit. And now this is a plot that's a little bit technical, but just for the uh, aficionados in the audience very quickly, this is just showing you distance distance on it and the x-axis through the, the, huge, the, the full scale of the universe. And this is brightness, radio brightness on the y-axis. And what I want to show you is that these are all the galactic sources that were known prior to the detection of that magnetar. They're all very nearby and low brightness. But then the source that we found, the magnetar, was way up here nearby. So nearby on this side of the plot, but very high. And these are where the FRBs sit. So at great distance, uh, they're not that, you know, they're far away. So most of them are, are you know, we detect them, but they're not hugely um, observably bright. And the point is that these lines are lines of constant energy. So the point is that this magnetar here, the radio burst, is similar in energy to the least energetic fast radio bursts. So it could be if you if you took that magnetar and you put it in a nearby galaxy, it would look just like an FRB. So that's why we think magnetars are very good candidates. But you see there's so many orders of magnitude of energy that are not covered. This is the brightest thing we've ever seen in the galaxy. But you see there's another six to nine orders of magnitude and energy that the fast radio bursts cover that the magnetar, uh, we don't know if it can do that. So some FRBs might be magnetars, but we certainly don't know that all of them are. Um, so the Time Fast Radio Burst Project, we detect lots and lots of FRBs and it's, we published recently our first major catalog, 500 sources with in-depth analysis. We are now sending out each FRB that we detect in real time through um, the internet. If you're interested in getting them on your computer, you can get them. And here's the website where you can go. Uh, and uh, yeah, we just recently published this 30 more repeaters. And soon we will be publishing our second catalog, which has more than 3,000 repeater uh, FRBs in it. So in summary, uh, FRBs are mysterious. Um, some may be magnetars, but we don't know what the others are, and we're working on it. Some repeat, and we don't yet know. Could there be multiple classes of astrophysical objects that produce these types of births? Maybe. Maybe some repeat, some don't. Uh, but here in Canada, we are leading the world in detection of FRBs um, and helping to solve this mystery. And um, even if, and like I like to say, and I emphasize a little bit more in the talk, in talks of the physics department today, even if we never figure out what these things are, Maybe we won't. In science, you don't always, you know, you get what you get. But no matter what, they are actually fantastic probes 
uh, of the universe. That when you, me you, you see that dispersion, you're getting measure a measure of how many free electrons there are. The structure, the large scale structure of the universe, FRBs are, are, are probing and are teaching us uh, all about that. So I say to you, stay tuned. And thank you very much. Thank you, Vicki, for a very enlightening talk, a very mysterious talk, and very illuminating as well. I just really enjoyed that talk. Uh, we have an opportunity. Are you yelling? Um, what was it about the microwave bursts that didn't alert you that they were close? Like if the time dependent dispersion of the fast radio bursts were cosmological distance, how did they look so similar that they're actually coming from the same building? So it's a really good question. And I, I don't know the answer. And, and the parks people never figured it out. And they did take some, some engineers went and took them apart and tried to reproduce it. Some microwave ovens, they bought a few different ones. Some did it, some didn't. So they're but ultimately, they just, as astronomers, they're producing the high frequency before they're producing the low frequency, just as part of the electronics, I guess. Yes, okay. and we don't, we, we never, there was never a good answer to that question. And the pro, we just, I mean, we wanted to study. We're astronomers. We didn't care about yeah. the microwave ovens. So. Thank you. But it's, I mean, if you could figure it out, I suppose there's some re weird reason. But we don't know what it is. Uh, hi, so could you explain like, why the free electrons in the ISM is making the speed of a uh, high frequency uh, radio waves faster? Yeah, so um, if you take uh, a course in um, in electricity and magnetism, you will you will study the propagation of any type of light in different types of material. And basically, um, you know, uh, you have, a, a, what is light? Light is a electric field, a magnetic field. And you have an electron, which is a charged particle. It gets accelerated by the electric field uh, that's part of the light. And so when you have free electrons, they are, as the, uh, as the light wave travels, they, they will get excited, they will re-emit, and they re-emit in a, in a frequency sort of dependent way, depending on the, pl on the, on the, um, on the um, density of the plasma. So uh, when you have cold plasma, this, this, this effect happens. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's how the uh, plasma is responding to that particular uh, 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 electromagnetic wave. Yeah. So, Vicky, we have a question online, which is whether you could share any word about the status of the outrigger systems for China. Oh, yeah, I didn't say anything about that. Um, yeah, I would love to tell you about that. I thought I was running out of time. So, um, so Chime is fantastic. The Chime telescope is fantastic at finding, I think I, I have something for you. Uh, yeah, I'll just put this drone, um, this is a picture of Chime from a drone, which you can enjoy while I explain this. But uh, the Chime telescope is wonderful for finding many, many fast radio bursts, but it is not very good at localizing them on the sky. So the precision with which you can determine the, um, uh, the, where it came from is similar to for the Parkes telescope. So it's it, the, the, for those of you who are curious, it's about the size of the full moon. And in that region, there's hundreds of galaxies. And so uh, we'd love to be able to know what the host galaxy is of every Chime FRB. We would just, we would love to do this. And so what we're doing is we're building smaller versions of Chime at uh, very large distances from Chime, at continental distances. So we're building three of these, and this is uh, thanks to a grant from the US Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Moore of Moore's Law and Intel. They gave us 
uh, about uh, $12 million to build these new uh, ver smaller versions of Chime, just one cylinder. One is going to be, is already built, is in British Columbia, about 100 kilometers from Chime. And we've already built a second one in uh, West Virginia at the site, uh, in a radio quiet zone there, because we don't want a lot of interference. And we're building a third one this summer in California. And together they are going to be an interferometer like the VLA, but with much larger baseline, uh, much larger separations that give much more precise position than even the VLA. And it will allow us, um, the idea will be that the uh, uh, outrigger telescopes will be constantly viewing the same sky that Chime sees, but not saving all the data. They're just buffering the data, buffering and overwriting it. But when Chime says, oh, there's an FRB, each outrigger telescope will quickly dump their buffer, save the buffer, write it to disk, and then we'll collect it all and we will analyze it together. We'll correlate it uh, to determine the very, a very precise position on the sky. And not only for every Chime FRB will we know the location, we'll, we'll be able to then get the galaxy and, um, and even where it is relative to the center of the galaxy, we'll know where in the galaxy it's coming from. So we're working on that right now. It's a big, a big project. Yeah, thank you for that question, whoever asked it. Uh, thanks for the talk. Excellent. Uh, I was just wondering if you found any correlation or are there any correlations being looked at to any other areas of cosmology based on fast radio bursts? Um, well, you, you mean, yes. Um, well, okay, so um, I think what you're asking is, how can you go about using these as, as cosmological probes? How do they also probe the, the structure of the universe? Is that what right. you mean? Right, and do they have any correlation to any other fields within cosmology? Oh, yeah. Well, so I'll show you, I'll show you one plot here. This is a little bit technical, but w one of the big problems in cosmology has been that cosmological models predict um, uh, a certain amount of matter in the universe. But when you look at all the matter that's in stars and in galaxies and in the gas, and it, it's not enough matter. And it doesn't agree with what the cosmological model says. And so the assumption has been that there is some missing matter that is between galaxies and just hard to detect. And that's been an assumption. But we are, with FRBs, you can now directly see that matter because uh, it's known to be ionized. And so when it's ionized, that means it's free electrons. And so it's causing the dispersion. So here is a beautiful correlation for the small handful of galaxies that have been identified for fast radio bursts. Um, the, the, the x-axis is the distance to the galaxy. And the y-axis is the um, amount of dispersion from the intergalactic medium. So you've subtracted off the component from our own galaxy. And what you see is there's a, there's a beautiful correlation there. You can see each point that goes along the line. That's exactly the predicted line. And so it's showing us that, oh, actually, we can see the matter between the galaxies using fast radio bursts. Um, there's other things that fast radio bursts allow you to do. So I, 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 it, it, there's a lot of, it's, a, it's an interesting story to tell, but there's so much. It, it's really rich. Um, the radio waves, I didn't tell you this, but the radio waves that are coming from fast radio bursts are polarized. They're polarized. And that allows you to actually measure, um, inf get information about the magnetic fields along the, pro the propagation uh, path. And for at least one of them, we know there's a massive magnetic field in its, along its propagation path. So it's telling us something about the local environment. And we hope it's going to teach us about intergalactic magnetic fields eventually. So that's another thing that you could do with it. There's a few different, a few, I mean, I could, I could go on and on. I'm resisting. But if you want more information, I'm happy to tell you. Dark matter, yeah, actually, yes, uh, because um, s some models of dark matter uh, are in um, compact objects, um, and 
if you have enough fast radio bursts and they're in a galaxy and there's some uh, massive dark matter structures, they can gravitationally lens um, uh, a fast radio burst and then you would see two of them. And so we've done a search for that in all of our data and we've we haven't yet seen anything like that. It should be rare, it should be rare, but you can set interesting limits on certain uh, mass scales of dark matter. Uh, you can say, okay, it can't be uh, 30 solar mass black holes or something like that. So there is a, an interesting phase space that FFRBs allow you to constrain um, by, uh, through gravitational lensing. Um, you said there was the three more chimes, smaller chimes being built. Um, one seems to be very close to Penticton. Um, and yet I thought they were supposed to be spaced away from it. Yes. So, yes. Uh, so there's a, f so first of all, the one that is very close to Penticton is still about a hundred kilometers away, which um, allows you to, to uh, localize on the sky in at least one dimension uh, well enough to, in principle, identify the host. Um, so it's, it's still going to be useful, but really it was a, a very helpful test bed because the others are, are, are remote. They're far away from where the team is. And so, for example, our, our collaborators uh, at University of British Columbia um, have been incredibly uh, 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 helpful and, ha and, and basically built this, this thing there, and they could test out different ideas for how to build them. Uh, and you find all the mistakes in how you build it by, it, 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 it's like a, a, a test case, but it's a scientifically useful test case because it's still at a large enough distance that even if one of the two other outriggers is, fails for some reason, uh, like the internet is down, we can't get the data, or the electricity was down that day and it didn't buff, dump its buffer, if you have two of them, you will still know what the host is, but you won't know where in the host it is. So it's, it's, it was both for convenience of location to access easily and test, as well as as a fail-safe. You want to have three of them. Um, uh, but, but really, the long baselines are going are gonna to give you where within the host galaxy it is. And um, I noticed you said they were in uh, shipping containers. Does it work all year round? Does it chime go all year round? And do people work in those shipping containers all year round? It's all automated. So they're not there. So, so we do have one. Um, one of our team members is on site and goes in, um, has to fix things. Uh, it, you know, things break or there's a power failure or the coolant. It's uh, all these computers. They, they generate a ton of heat. There's a liquid, liquid coolant that's being uh, piped through every one of these computers. Sometimes there's a leak or sometimes, like all sorts of things happen, you, you can't imagine. And, and so we have one staff person on site who, who takes care of a lot of that, but, but it, it's all, it is all automated. Thank you. Uh, question over here. Hi. So my question is that um, I noticed that a lot of the telescopes you use are on Earth. Is it possible that we can create a telescope that's outside, like on space, so that we can track radio waves better? Um, yeah, so for the purposes of, um, so, so I think you're asking a really important question in that interferometers, they become more powerful in terms of their ability to pinpoint, the, f the further apart are the antennas. And so you've seen this actually beautifully done if, if you followed the Event Horizon Telescope, which is an interferometer that imaged a black hole. If you remember, it, it made the spectacular image. It looked a little bit like this donut on fire, but it was um, a, a an actual image of the Event Horizon of the black hole. And it was done through this interferometry with telescopes all over the globe observing the same source and uh, enabling a very, very uh, a, a detailed picture to, to emerge. And what's actually limiting them is now the size of the planet. And so they would love to put a radio telescope in orbit or on the moon or something. So that would be a fantastic thing to do. 
uh, but it's really, really expensive. And uh, to be sensitive, you want a very large aperture. You want a large collecting area. And it's hard to launch things like that. You'd have to say, okay, you have to launch it, fold it up, and then unfold it or something like that, which the James Webb Space Telescope just did a fantastic, inspirational job. Like, we're like, wow. And um, so maybe you could do that. And there are actually proposals to build to build space-based radio telescopes. In fact, there was once a spa space-based radio telescope, not a very large telescope. I think it was like eight meters. Uh, and it did space VLBI, uh, space, uh, it, it did space interferometry, and it made some nice images, but it was such a small telescope, it could only detect the brightest, brightest, brightest sources. So um, putting it on the moon is a great idea, it's just super expensive. You had mentioned that when you saw... By the way, I love this talk, so thank you very oh, much. Thank for that. you. Um, the first one came from a dwarf. The first one that you were able to identify came from a dwarf galaxy. You raised the question of why small, you know, would it come from a small? Is there more thinking on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, what's amazing is so my, my, my counterparts in Australia, they um, uh, have another telescope called the Australia square kilometer array pathfinder called ASCAP, which you can Google. And ASCAP is good at finding FRBs and localizing them at the same time. And uh, I think in the histogram I showed you of detections, you saw they had a whole bunch. Uh, but it's not an event rate like Chime, but still they can localize. And so they have localized, uh, it's a couple dozen sources now. And uh, almost none of them is in a dwarf galaxy. So the, the fact the first one was in a dwarf was a fluke. And, and you don't know how many papers were written about it. Everybody's like, why a dwarf? You know, and then you, they were trying to find other astrophysical objects that are preferentially located in dwarf galaxies and uh, like the certain types of supernova that happen more often in dwarf galaxies. And then next lo localization, host galaxy, their spiral galaxy, big spiral, big elliptical, you know, everything but. And then recently someone found a second one in a dwarf. But it just goes to show you they're found in all sorts of types of galaxies. And it was just a fluke that the first one happened to be a dwarf. And all the papers that were, okay, no. It's, uh, I just have a question for you. This is so much fun. Um, so now that you have thousands of examples as to where they're coming from and which galaxies are repeating them, are there any new experiments or next steps to try and figure out what they are? Well, um, I mean, the, so we are building the outriggers in order to, so I, you could say, okay, how can you figure out? You can't go. So you, how are you going to figure it out? So one way you can figure it out is by finding where they are with respect to, so one type of source is going to be only in the centers of galaxies. And one might be, only on the outskirts of galaxies. And so with 24 of them, we're getting a mishmash. We're not getting a clear picture. So if, you have, if you're gonna have a thousand of them, ah, maybe you're gonna start to see there's certain types that only are in the outskirts of galaxies and those have certain properties. So I think that's one piece of the puzzle. But another piece of the puzzle, and we're also working on it simultaneously, is finding the nearest fast radio bursts. So there's some that are in very nearby galaxies and there, you have a hope, if it were a magnetar, magnetars like to produce X-ray bursts. You might see a coincident X-ray burst at the same time as the fast radio burst. Uh, and so you will, will want to look with telescopes from other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, X-ray, gamma ray, optical, all at the same time, and see, can you detect emission from any other part? And if you see X-rays and gamma rays, that's going to smell a lot like a magnetar. So that's another path that we're using to try and determine what they are. Uh, but the, you know, there's other ideas as well. So uh, you know, we now have gravitational wave detectors. So if some of them were colliding neutron stars, the repeaters can't be. But if some of them don't repeat and are colliding neutron stars, and they're, you find a nearby one, well, the, the, the gravitational wave detectors will see it, and then we'll know. Because they have a really clear signal of in spiraling Star. So that's another way that you might be able to figure it out. But we're certainly open to other ideas. Vicky, we have another question online. This one's from Armin Mir. 
So they say, thanks for the presentation. Is there any correlation between the number of observed bursts and the source's distances? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you would totally expect that. So this this is all. Uh, so so the answer is sort of. The, so one, in our recent paper where we announced an, another, um, whatever, I forget, 30, 30 repeating fast radio bursts, we can now start to see that if you take the repeating fast radio bursts, the average dispersion measure of repeating sources is smaller than the average dispersion measure of non-repeating sources. And when you think about it, it's totally expected. Because for repeating sources, you have to see two bursts. And so you're typically going to see the closest ones first. Because the ones that are far away, another burst is, is harder to detect. It's just going to be fainter, typically. So in some sense, the, the closest ones we have seen to repeat were the furthest ones we haven't. But then we also look to see... Um, do, is there a correlation with, just amongst the repeaters, do you see um, a, a higher number of repeat bursts from lower dispersion measure sources versus higher dispersion measure sources? And there we don't see a difference. We, we don't see that effect. But it's 50 sources is still not enough. Once we have maybe a few hundred and we have more statistics, maybe we expect to see that. We fully expect to see that, but we haven't, haven't yet. So sort of we see I have a second question online, if I can do that, Mr. Uh, question Chair. This one's from Karen Thanjire, or Jauer. Amongst all the proposed models of FRBs, which is your favorite pick, given your rich and long experience? I, I don't, yeah. I, so, you know, the, the, the experience, the, the, what my experience tells me is that don't pick, um, because, uh, you know, it's what do the data tell you, and the data tell you we don't yet know. Uh, so I, I love magnetars. I, in fact, I didn't mention this, but I worked for 20 years on magnetars. So it was just such a thrill when a magnetar produced a fast radio burst. And so in that sense, it's my favorite type of object. But I don't believe that uh, we have the evidence that all or even most FRBs are magnetars. And I also think that we're... Um, you know, we are incredibly creative as, as humans and uh, have, first of all, managed to detect these crazy things. I mean, millisecond, it's gone. Like, and yeah, we detect them. We found, we have technology here in Canada where we, we can do this really hard problem. But um, I don't know if we're creative enough to think of uh, all the amazing things that nature can produce. So we have ideas, but it could be something we just have never thought about. And will we ever know? I don't know. We may never know. So it's not from aliens. The radio bus. Sorry, what? Oh, yeah. So it's not from alien or anything? We, yeah, there's no evidence that it's from aliens. Okay. Oh, man, that's really Is painful. that your question? <laughs> Anyways, I also hear uh, red news like it's coming from black holes, but I'm not sure how accurate that news is. What's your yeah, take on that? There are some models that involve black holes. There's model typically it, it involves something falling into a supermassive black hole. So supermassive black holes are these million to billion solar mass black holes that are at centers of galaxies. Our own Milky Way has a supermassive black hole at the center. Uh, and so there are some models of uh, fast radio bursts as material falling in. But the challenge in those models is if you calculate uh, the time scale for the fall in, it's longer than milliseconds. It's very hard to produce a very, very short burst in that way. And so those models are pretty, and moreover, if you look at the ASCAP localizations, most of them are not at the center of the galaxy. They're on the edge where there's no supermassive black hole. So that model is disfavored. Can I say none of them arise that way? 
it, it would be hard. It's I can't. I'm not going to say that for sure, but there, it's definitely not one of the favorite models presently. This one's not online. This is all me. What's the future of Chime? Uh, the future of Chime. Well, um, Chime has, um, you know, it it uh, it operates autonomously. There's no um, there's no consumables except electricity. You need to plug it in, and it uh, sees the entire. That's a fantastic monitor, not only of every single position in the northern sky every day, but also uh, just rare events. So even if Chime is looking directly overhead. It can still, it has some sensitivity to the, the rest of the sky. It's, it's a tremendous monitor for radio signals. So uh, Chime has a, a very bright future scientifically. It can produce, uh, it can continue to operate and to detect these sources. And then once you add in the outriggers, it's, a, um, it's going to be, uh, it's already a world-class instrument, but it's, it's going to be really phenomenal in, in a whole new way. So it has a pretty bright future scientifically. <laughs> Thank you all for for patiently uh, for these amazing questions. What it all? This is, you guys are amazing. Is there somebody else? There's one more online there. Yes, there is. So Alan Dyer says, has Chime been able to make the types of observations it was originally designed for? Uh, or has the FRB program taken over all the observing time? Thanks. Great talk. Oh, uh, great question. Yeah. So you might have noticed the name is Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment. And there's no FRB in the name. It's, uh, it's, Chime was designed for a totally different purpose. Chime is an incredible instrument designed by cosmologists in Canada, of which I am not. I was, I'm not a cosmologist. Other people designed Chime in order to map the hydrogen gas throughout the uh, in um, in order to study the accelerating expansion of the universe, and it's doing that as well. So what's amazing about Chime is you can do both experiments at the same time, and it, the, the for, to map hydrogen, it actually takes many years to build up the signal. So it's not like we can just not like radio bursts that happen. Uh, all the time, and you can publish a whole bunch. There, they have to accumulate lots of data over many years in order to detect what they're looking for. So, stay tuned. There will be uh, lots of other uh, Chime uh, cosmology papers coming out, um, but I'm not involved in that. It's, uh, with the pandemic and everything, it's been uh, a little bit of a challenge. So I'm delighted you were able to make the travel and uh, spend some time here at Queens and interact with our students. It's been a very fascinating day. Uh, it was a, it, just a wonderful visit. Thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, you're listen. free to go. <laughs> just one quick announcement. I wanted to highlight just to remind people. Um, there is, at Queen's, the Walk Home program. So if anybody wanted support to get home and feel safe, um, I did want to highlight the availability of that program. So if anybody wants to call that, there is a, some posters at the back of the room that Alex has, and you can just speak to her. And there they are people that can walk you home. So uh, have a great night, and thanks again, Vicki.